There are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. There are also unknown knowns. We are the Ancient and Esoteric Order of the Jackalope, a secret society devoted to unearthing and sharing this forgotten knowledge. Today's Lodge Meeting is brought to you by Expanding Mattress. At first it was so cute, it came in the tiniest box. And when you removed it from the box, it grew into the most comfortable queen-sized mattress. But it didn't stop growing, did it? At first, it was so slight you just thought your sheets had shrunk. But now, it's too big to fit through the door. Soon, it will fill the entire bedroom, and then your entire apartment, and perhaps one day, the entire world. But you won't be there to see it. You'll have been crushed in the pillowy embrace of the mattress. Expanding mattress. Its conquest is inevitable. Today's presentation, Cold Hard Cash, presented by number 13. What is money? My dictionary, that's uh, Webster's Ninth New Collegiate for those of you who care, defines money as something generally accepted as a medium of exchange, a measure of value, or a means of payment. That's a good start, but like most dictionary definitions, it's clearly not the whole story. Value can only be part of the equation. Your house and your car have value, but they're not money. Your wife and your kids have value, and you wouldn't consider them money either. Or if you would, you're sick. The most important parts of that definition is that money is a medium of exchange, which is to say it can be traded for goods and services. Economists might also add that money should be storable, which is to say non-perishable so that it doesn't spoil on you, portable so that you can take it around with you, recognizable so that you don't have to argue with other people about whether it's money, and divisible so that you can scale your expenditures to your purchase. Small societies don't need money because their transactions are simple. I trade you a fish for three apples. You help work my fields, so I give you a share of the harvest. It's the barter system, and it works. But at some point your society gets so large, and the transaction's so complicated, that you need money. Maybe I need something right now and I don't have anything to trade, but a decade ago I was very generous to you. Maybe I need to acquire goods and services from a stranger who I may never see again. Money provides a quick, easy way of settling accounts that doesn't require everyone in your society to have a long memory or to keep elaborate records of prior transactions. Most societies start off with what we call commodity money, objects which have some sort of practical use or symbolic value. There's a balancing act to be done here. You want your money to have some practical use, but not so much practical use that you're tempted to use it. You want the money to have some symbolic value, but not so much symbolic value that you're tempted to not use it at all. Cultures have used shells, feathers, grain, spices, cloth, metal bracelets, just about anything you can imagine, really. The Lydians introduced gold and silver coins. Low practical use, moderate symbolic value. The Spartans used iron coins, though it's hard to imagine that practice lasting past the end of the Bronze Age. Which brings us, in a roundabout way, to the subject of our tale, the Yap Islands at the western end of the Carolines in the Federated States of Micronesia. The Yap Islands are famous around the world for their money, giant stone coins called rye or fay. These are large stone disks carved from a type of glittery limestone called aragonite, ranging in size from a few feet across to over 12 feet in diameter. They also have a hole in the center which allows them to be moved around, the smaller ones by ropes and the larger ones by wooden poles. Now you're probably thinking, who makes money out of stones? They're just lying around everywhere. Well, why don't you reserve your judgment until I tell you how they're made? First, you should know there's no aragonite on Yap. So to make rye, you first have to get your chief's permission to paddle 250 miles southwest across treacherous South Pacific waters to the island of Palau. Once they're there, you have to deal with the Palauan tribesmen to use their Aragonite quarries. Depending on when you're attempting to do this, the Palauans may be actively hostile, they may be indifferent, or they may just charge you an arm and a leg. Once you've struck that deal, you'll have to hike miles inland through the jungle to use those quarries. Once there, you'll spend months or even years painstakingly forming and separating a disc from a cave wall and then refining its appearance. All of this has to be done with bone and shell tools, or if you're lucky enough, maybe you have iron tools from European traders. Then you'll have to transport the finished stones back through the jungle to the shore. At the shore, you'll have to maneuver the rye through the pounding surf and load them onto canoes or rafts. Then you'll have to paddle all the way back to Yap, this time with the heavy stone lowering your draft and making your craft less maneuverable. Once you're home, that rye still isn't yours. It belongs to the chief who gave you leave to go and make it in the first place, and he'll hold on to it until you've paid him off with labor, usually collecting baskets of taro or coconuts. He'll also take about 40% of all the rye made on the expedition as tribute. Once it's yours, though, you'll take that rye and put it somewhere prominent near your home or near the meeting house so that everyone can marvel at your newfound wealth. 
If you're feeling particularly wealthy or ostentatious, you might line a nearby road or path with your rye, creating a money bank. How did the Yappies even settle on such a strange currency? Oral tradition claims that hundreds of years ago, the legendary navigator Anagumang, who had learned magic at the hand of the fairy mother Legerem, took a crew of seven brave men west to Palau to find the beautiful shining stone. First, they sculpted it into the shape of a whale, but that proved less pleasing to the eye, and eventually they settled on a round shape similar to the full moon. When the shining stones were returned to Yap, they were valued for their great beauty. Archaeological evidence suggests that quarrying activities on Palau go back to almost 500 CE. Quarrying increased in intensity after 1200 CE, when the chiefs of Western Yap may have been promoting rye as a way to displace a shell currency called Gao, which was controlled by the chiefs of Eastern Yap. One way they accomplished this was by promoting competition between navigators like Anagumang to bring back the largest, most impressive, and beautiful rye. And it worked! Some estimates claim that during Rye's heyday, nearly 10% of Yap's adult male population might be involved in the quarrying and shipping of the stones. That's the equivalent of having 15 million people working directly for the U.S. Mint printing dollar bills today. What's really interesting, though, is the way Rye call you to question a lot of your learned ideas about money and how it functions. We mentioned the concept of commodity currency at the beginning of the episode. Most economists would say that it's the earliest stage of money most societies go through. But Rye stones don't fit into this category at all. They have no practical use and no symbolic or religious value. Instead, rye seem to be one of the earliest examples of fiat currency, money which has value only because we as a society agree that it has value. That's a stage your own money only reached with the abolition of the gold standard in the 1970s, some 500 to 1,000 years after the Yappies. We also talked about four qualities that money should have. We can all agree that rye is definitely storable and highly recognizable. But what about divisible? You can't exactly break up a huge, finely sculpted stone into pebbles without ruining what value it does have. The Yappies don't even try. For regular transactions, they used the barter system or shell money. When trading with other Micronesians, they used woven mats. Trade with Europeans or the Chinese was done in commodity goods. Heck, rye wasn't even the common medium of exchange on the island. Prices were usually set in baskets of taro root or other commonly exchanged agricultural items. So if you're not buying stuff with them, what good are rye? Well, in one sense, they're the ultimate in signaling, a luxury good like a Louis Vuitton handbag or a Bentley that lets your neighbors know just how good you've got it. Unlike most luxury goods, rye are exchanged, just not frequently. Here's where we get to another interesting fact. The stones have no set value. In general, larger stones are more valuable than smaller ones, but the primary determinant of its value is the story of the stone itself. Did it have distinctive craftsmanship or great beauty? Was the expedition that fetched it a perilous one that faced hostile tribes and crossed turbulent seas? Had it been owned by great chiefs or famous heroes? Did it have strange or memorable stories attached to it? Particularly notable rye might have names attached to them, sometimes descriptive, sometimes names inherited from previous owners. One is called the Stone Without Tears, because it's one of the few stones on the islands where no one died on the trip back from Palau, which was unique in and of itself. It's valued just as much as stones where people did die on the trip. And how were they exchanged? Well, oftentimes it was a straight-up trade. A less valuable stone might go for a pig or a few months of food. But more often not, they were done as gift exchanges or for ceremonial purposes. They might be given to as a nest egg to a newlywed couple, or presented to a newborn child as sort of a half-ton savings bond. More valuable stones might be traded between villages to secure allies in times of war, paid as reparations after a conflict, or left as security deposits so that you could use a tribe's lands and resources for a time. And then there's the matter of the exchange itself. You'll remember we said money had to be portable. Well, we can all agree that something weighing hundreds of pounds isn't exactly portable. So how do you trade something that you can't move? Again, the Yappies don't even try. Smaller stones could and would be moved, but larger stones would just stay where they were. After an exchange, word would get out, and sooner or later everyone on the island knew the stone had a new owner. It was just a new chapter in the stone's history and lineage. In effect, the oral tradition of the island became an early form of blockchain, where each stone carried its own transaction history around with it. One more thing the Yappies beat us to by thousands of years. Eat that, Satoshi Nakamoto! With all that going on, it's no wonder that when Europeans first encountered Yap, they were fascinated and bewildered by money that seemed simultaneously years ahead and years behind of their own. During the colonial period, Yap was a tempting target for Europeans. It was rich in natural resources, mother of pearl, Bechtemer or Trepang, a sea cucumber highly valued in East Asia for its purported aphrodisiac qualities. And most importantly, 
copra, dried coconut kernels that could be pressed to extract oil. The Yappies, well, they were just as bewildering as the money. Their relaxed island lifestyle was often interpreted as laziness. They liked alcohol and tobacco, but seemed entirely uninterested in anything else the Europeans had to offer, or rather, were willing to offer. And yet, for a few weeks each year, the so-called lazy islanders would work themselves like dogs to make and buy seemingly useless stone money. It was utterly confounding. The Spanish tried to exploit the islands for a few hundred years, but eventually gave up in frustration. Their resulting policy of benign neglect opened the door for Dutch, British, and German interests to try and make a go of it, but the returns were minimal. Until the arrival of David Dean O'Keefe. At first glance, David Dean O'Keefe seems like a stereotype right out of central casting. A big, burly Irishman with red hair and an explosive temper to match. Born in Ireland in 1824, he emigrated to America during the potato famine, eventually settling in Savannah, where he found work as a sailor. During the Civil War, he ran the Union blockade, and after the war, he plied a two-legged version of the triangle trade, ditching the slaves but keeping the molasses and rum. He eventually married Catherine Masters, a sharp-tongued harpy 20 years his junior. They did not have a particularly happy marriage, but had one daughter, Louisa Veronica, better known as Lulu. In 1866, when O'Keefe was captain of the Anna Sims, he struck crew member William Geary over some minor offense. Geary retaliated, and the fight escalated until Geary was lying dead on the deck with a bullet hole in his head. O'Keefe was arrested and thrown in jail. He was eventually found not guilty by reason of self-defense, but his reputation with the local sailors was ruined and he found it hard to find work or hire men to crew his ships. So he decided to seek his fortunes elsewhere and signed on as the first mate on the Belvedere, bound for New York. Savannah Gossip circulated rumors about his abrupt departure, most of them implying he'd killed again and needed to get out of town quickly. In one version... It was in a drunken brawl outside Piggy McBride's saloon. In another, it was the last duel ever fought in Savannah. But it wasn't anything nearly as exciting. O'Keefe stayed with the Belvedere when it left New York for Liverpool and made it most of the way to Manila before jumping ship in Hong Kong after an argument with the captain. He wrote a nice letter to Catherine back in Savannah, sending her a bank draft for $167 and promising to be home soon. And while that may have been his intention at the time, he'd never see America again. Which brings us to his arrival on Yap. In the most common version of the story, O'Keefe's ship is sunk by a typhoon and he washes ashore on Yap, where he's nursed back to health by a local sorcerer. The truth is a lot less romantic. O'Keefe first arrived on Yap in October 1871 as part of a trading expedition. It's not terribly exciting, so if you want to continue to believe the romantic version, I won't blame you. However he got there, he liked the island, and the island liked him. In 1872, he returned to the island with a rundown Chinese junk named Catherine after his wife, and set up shop. Within a decade, O'Keefe would have Yap exporting hundreds of tons of copper a year, more than any other island in Micronesia, with his own share of that export more than every other trader on the island combined. His business empire included a coconut plantation on the island of Mapia, and commercial interests on Sansarol, and was valued at millions of dollars. He had a fleet of ships, dozens of employees, hundreds of native laborers, and a richly appointed mansion on the island of Tarang. Locals called him King O'Keefe, though we should stress that he didn't have any Kipling-esque delusions of grandeur. It was just a nickname. So how did O'Keefe succeed where others had failed? Well, he studied the situation in Yap and came to a simple conclusion. If the Yappies don't value what you're offering, find out what they do value and offer it to them. It seems obvious in retrospect, but at the time it was a stroke of genius. In this case, what the Yappies wanted was rye. O'Keefe couldn't quarry the stones for them, but he could make the process faster and easier. He offered the islanders safe passage to and from Palau and larger, more modern ships, and iron tools to work the stones. After the return voyage, he'd hold on to the rye until presented with an appropriate amount of trade goods. And the Yappies went for it hard. When O'Keefe first arrived on the island, rye were relatively rare. By the turn of the century, there were thousands. They also increased in size. Canoes and rafts could only carry safely stones a meter or two in diameter, but O'Keefe's vessels allowed the quarrying of much larger stones, some a staggering four meters across. In essence, O'Keefe had set himself up as a new chief, allowing people to bypass existing tribal structures to access the most coveted luxury good, which made existing chiefs none too happy. Keeping with Thomas Paine's maxim, that which we obtain too easily we esteem too lightly, they held that the new rye were to be of lesser value than their predecessors despite their otherwise excellent size and quality. The new stones couldn't be completely devalued without calling the legitimacy of all stones into question, so they did retain some value. And in the process... Well, O'Keefe introduced the concept of inflation to Yap. 
O'Keefe's business rivals accused him of forcing the Yappies into slavery, flogging them, throwing the sick and injured to the sharks, despoiling their women and stealing their property. But it turned out these were mostly just jealous accusations with no foundation in reality. O'Keefe had positive relations with the locals for the most part. He seemed to understand and appreciate their way of life, even if he did exploit it for his own ends. Now this isn't to say he was all smiles and sunshine, either. When one of his ships went down off the coast of Palau, nearby villagers plundered the wreck before salvage operations could arrive. O'Keefe called in the British Navy, who bombarded the village in retribution. His business-savvy and positive relationship with the Yappies allowed O'Keefe to build an independent commercial empire greater than all the other interests in the islands combined. The other operators had to copy his techniques just to keep up. He would occasionally send checks to Catherine and Lulu to cover living expenses, though he never really made any plans to either return to Savannah or bring his family to Yap. Most likely that was because he had bigamously married Charlotte Terry, the half-native daughter of a local trader, and openly kept her aunt Doliboo as a mistress. He had numerous children by both women. O'Keefe managed to beat the Dutch, the British, and the Spanish, but he may have ultimately met his match in the Germans, who purchased most of Spain's Pacific holdings in 1898. They quickly passed a law outlawing the production of rye. The measure was primarily intended to increase the number of available workers that they could draft for civil engineering projects, but it may also have been intended to break the back of O'Keefe and other traders who followed in his footsteps. In the long run, it might have worked. In the short run, it didn't matter. In 1901, O'Keefe took a routine business trip to Hong Kong with two of his sons. The return trip left on May 7th, and their ship was never seen again. Eventually, they were declared lost at sea. O'Keefe's will left most of his estate to his Yappies family, though he did arrange a generous share for Lulu. He left Catherine out of the will entirely. German law at the time, though, guaranteed a legitimate surviving spouse at least 50% of any state. So Catherine sued. Savannah Papers claimed his holdings were worth potentially $10 million, but after Catherine's lawyers visited Yap, they downgraded that to a mere 500000 She eventually settled for a mere 10000 It seems like chump change, but chump change is probably preferable to fighting an expensive legal battle from half a world away. In some ways, O'Keefe's passing was the end of an era. The German prohibition on making new rye stood, though they couldn't rob the existing rye of their value. In one charming incident, the Germans shamed locals into fulfilling their civic duties by defacing keystones with paint. It did the trick. The symbolic loss of the rye meant more to the Yappies than losing a few Deutschmarks. After World War I, Yap passed into the hands of the Japanese. After World War II, the Americans took over. In 1976, it became part of the newly founded Federated States of Micronesia. In 1950, Lawrence Klingman wrote a highly fictionalized biography of O'Keefe, His Majesty O'Keefe, which was turned into a movie starring Burt Lancaster. The resulting publicity brought descendants out of the woodwork to press claims for a share of his fabulous wealth, which of course no longer existed. O'Keefe's business had been liquidated shortly after his death and the proceeds long since spent. His land holdings had only been leases, and the mansion on Terang had been abandoned in the 1930s, turned into a Japanese munitions dump during World War II, and eventually bombed flat by the Allies. A Japanese survey in the 1920s counted 13,281 rye on the island. By 1965, the numbers had dwindled to a mere 6,000, some of the stones lost to time and nature, but many more destroyed by the Japanese during World War II to build fortifications. Rye are still traded on special occasions, but as before, most daily transactions are carried out with piddling small change. They used to be shells and woven mats. Today, it's the U.S. dollar. I consulted a number of sources while researching this episode, but found the following ones the most useful. Coralie Gilliland's The Stone Money of Yap, a numismatic survey. Francis X. Hessel's The Man Who Was Reputed to Be King. Scott M. Fitzpatrick's Banking on Stone Money. And Michael F. Bryan's Island Money. Island Money is probably one of the best magazine articles I've ever read. Seriously, go to our website, click on the link and read it. It's that damn good. There's also Lawrence Klingman's novel, His Majesty O'Keefe. It has some problematic mid-century attitudes about race, sex, and colonialism, but it is also not afraid to present a warts-and-all portrait of a historical figure. You can skip the movie version, which strips out all the nuance from the story so that you can get Burt Lancaster punching pirates in a flaming longhouse. Which is pretty cool, I guess. Ooh, and connections! After the Spanish-American War, the Germans purchased whatever Pacific holdings Spain hadn't ceded to the Americans, including Yap. The most significant Pacific engagement of the Spanish-American War was the Battle of Manila Bay. One of the heroes of that battle was Charles Vernon Gridley, subject of Series 1 episode, He Fired When Ready. David Dean O'Keefe's daughter Lulu had an unhappy marriage with semi-pro ball player Frank Dean Butler. Gold Brick Butler's only cup of coffee in the majors was five games with the New York Giants in 1895. Forty years later, Johnny Dickshot, subject of Series 1 episode, The Ugliest Man in Baseball, would also have a cup of coffee with the Giants. 
This episode was produced by David White for the Ancient and Esoteric Order of the Jackalope. It is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. The script of this episode, along with references, links, and other supporting materials, can be found on our website at orderofthejackalope.com. That's orderofthejackalope.com with hyphens between the words. Yeah, the regular version was taken. Follow us on social media to learn more about our release and production schedule. We can be found at Order Jackalope on Instagram, Tumblr, and Twitter. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends. Hey, you! Would you like to join the fastest-growing secret society in the nation? Of course you do. But before you can master the secret knowledge, you must share some secret knowledge of your own. Visit our website at orderthejackalope.com for more information.